assalamu alaikum students so this lecture is about cerebral cortex uh, we will discuss uh, hemisphere dominance the concept of hemispheric dominance language and how in the clinical disorders that are related with uh, language and speech so we start off with uh, a quote from roger sperry who performed split brain experiments uh, which were quite revolutionary back in 1981 uh, and he got a nobel prize for it uh this is his is a quote from his uh, nobel accepting speech uh the great pleasure and feeling in my right brain is more than my left brain can find the words to tell you uh so this this chap before before his experiments it wasn't known uh there wasn't much information about uh the versatile the versatility of the two hemispheres of the cerebral cortex uh the structure was pretty much looked like the same uh and uh, the division and function wasn't very much known uh, his experiments really the split brain experiments were uh instrumental in finding the uniqueness uh the difference uh between these two uh hemispheres and in fact he he helped establish that both Uh, uh hemispheres are in their own right uh, uh very very important uh, versatile however he did uh, uh mention uh, that one is dominant and the other is uh, non dominant uh, which later on was found that that is not exactly uh, correct because each one is dominant in its own right uh the functions do vary and uh, that we we will look at the, no, uh, the modern nomenclature of that okay so cerebral dominance and i put a question mark on it uh, why because the this word dominance uh, is maybe uh, can be misleading um, as we can see that uh, in a in a right handed individual uh, when we'll talk about that what is this handedness uh so most of us are right handed so in right handed individuals the left hemisphere is quote and quote dominant um by dominance we mean so this is if you look at this picture uh let me just magnify this if you look at this picture they have shown the left hemisphere like this okay uh and it seems that the left hemisphere is uh, gray it's uh, it's a bit boring as compared to what what is happening on the right side but you see that everything is slotted in uh, they have they've shown an office uh, an office space in which everything is uh, compartmentalized sequential uh, people know what they their bit of information is and they're doing it on their screens and this that the other and there is a very very clear structure to everything right Uh, and then there is a bridge uh, from the left to the right side and you see that on the right side the uh, things are quite colorful uh, people are meditating they are reading playing music uh, flying a kite uh, making a movie enjoying themselves uh, exploring so this is this is a pretty good diagram which go uh, which on the lighter side uh, does introduce to you uh the difference between these two hemispheres i.e. the uh, in a in a right-handed individual the dominant left hemisphere and the so-called non-dominant right hemisphere so with this nomenclature i would also like to uh, introduce uh the 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 more used uh contemporary current uh, nomenclature which is the categorical hemisphere and the rep representation hem uh, representational hemisphere that is categorical is the uh, so called dominant hemisphere and representational uh, hemisphere is the so called non dominant hemisphere now uh, if we look at the categorical hemisphere i e in a right handed individual what they used to say the dominant hemisphere you see that uh, it is sequential analytic so it it works uh, in bits uh, so it will it will uh, resolve uh one bit of information okay so if this is a task it will it will divide it into uh bits of that task okay 
So one task will be divided into, let's say, three processes. So first, it will work on this task, finish it. Then it will start with the second task, finish it, and then it will end it by resolving the third component. This is what they refer to as sequential, sequential analytics. So it, it, it needs to have a very clearly defined structure in the tasks and it goes after one bit at a time. Okay, this is sequential. It's a very powerful tool. It helps us uh, resolve uh, stuff in uh, mathematics or, or, or uh, very detailed analysis of things. Uh, it's a pretty powerful machine uh, we have there in, in the categorical hemisphere. Uh, it's linear, as I, as I mentioned, one bit at a time. Um, all your language is sitting in the categorical hemisphere. So the, the choice of words, the library, is in the categorical hemisphere. Okay? All the analytical ability that you have, uh, your ability to reason, the, your ability to think, your ability to uh, 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 arrive at conclusions uh, in complex situations, all of that stuff, mathematical reasoning and uh, so on and so forth, uh, all sits in the categorical hemisphere, the so-called dominant hemisphere. Okay, so what's 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 left then? One one would think a lot is left actually. So the represent uh, the representational or the non-dominant hemisphere uh, it relates to visuospatial relations. So what is vis vis visio visio relationships? Well, they are basically skills that we require. Uh, 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 during uh, movement, uh, depth and distance perception. Um, so for example, you are driving a car, okay? Uh, while you are driving a car, you need to be uh, uh, able to uh, realize the distance from the car in front of you, uh, from your surroundings, uh, on the road that you are driving on, uh, the, 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 the traffic lights, uh, warning signs, uh, information billboards that come in between, and so on and so forth. So, all of this requires uh, a, a set of uh, visual spatial skills for you to be able to perceive, analyze, synthesize uh, these visual patterns and images. Uh, visual spatial working memory is involved in recalling and manipulating images uh, to remain oriented in space and keep track of moving objects. Again, just keep keep in mind uh, that you're driving a car, or you are walking, uh, uh, say, on a on a road, and you're looking at things: uh, the road itself, the buildings, uh, the park on the on on a side, people approaching you, people behind, uh, bicycles or vehicles moving about. All of that depth perception, all of those mo moving objects. Uh, they require uh, a holistic, a combined uh, processing uh, for you to appreciate where you are, and and what the and these subject and these objects and these subjects, where are they in relation to you? So this all this depth perception business uh, is 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 what the representational hemisphere uh, gives you. Okay. Uh, you can't imagine driving a car, riding a bike, uh, or even walking even normally uh, outside without a functional representational hemisphere. Okay. Okay. And then they, there comes the language. Uh, so we we did we did mention that the language, the library, the words that you ch uh, choose to speak uh, sits in the categorical under the categorical hemisphere. So what what is this? Well, in in it's very interesting. It's the color of language, as they say. Uh, the emotional content, uh, uh, and and if I may just borrow from popular culture, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. It's the how you say it, which uh, the representational hemisphere uh, contributes to uh, speech, uh, to language. There are sensory and motor uh, elements to it. One very interesting aspect is how do these two uh, deal with language so you can you can see that language is written under categorical and then language is written under representational we've just discussed that 
this is the word selection while this is the color of language the intonations uh, uh, what you say and how you say it that business um, interestingly uh, brokers and vernikis if you remember these are two areas which uh, relate with speech with with language so vernik is very simply is the is the library of the brain is where the language is stored physically and broker is is the motor speech area which allows you to uh, phonate or uh, 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 allow you to articulate what you want to say so the motor aspect of speech uh, you can say that the sensory aspect of speech is related to vernikis while the motor aspect of speech is related to brokers uh, more on, on this uh, in a, in a bit in the following slides um the interesting part is uh, brokers and vernikis areas are in both hemispheres so while you can appreciate that the language the seat of language is the categorical hemisphere and this is where you basically talk from uh, the content and the motor aspect so what does the uh, broker and uh, uh, vernikis do in the representational hemisphere is the question then well they deal with the emotional content of language so the vernikis of the non dominant hemisphere uh, is 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 used to understand the emotional content of speech okay while the brokers is involved to uh, to to look at the emotional content of spoken language this is a very interesting uh, detail there uh, which uh, goes to show you that language is uh, again language is what makes us human language is how we communicate with each other express ourselves and so on and so forth and hence both hemispheres uh, they uh, contribute to the the breadth and depth of how language is used as a tool uh, by human beings uh, then there is uh, the ability to identify objects by their form so for example you can uh, without looking at it you can identify a key as a key or a ball as a ball uh, and so on and so forth so this this uh, ability is called stereognosis so stereognosis is your ability to identify objects not by looking at them by feeling them by by just the sensory perception the touch or fine touch and a stereognosis is lack of this ability so a stereognosis is when the representational hemisphere is damaged and it's not working properly then you won't be able to appreciate uh, this uh, this this feature recognition of faces we've talked about recognition of faces also is under representational hemisphere uh, music uh, the appreciation of music poetry uh, visual patterns colors all of this comes under the representational hemisphere secondly i mentioned handedness so i mentioned that most of us are left handed which means that uh, right handed i beg your pardon uh, which means that the left left hemisphere is the categorical one where everything or uh, the sequential and all the language sits um so hemispheric specialization is related to handedness so this is the uh, most famous um uh, the physical manifestation of which uh, hemisphere is the categorical one and which one is the representational one it's genet genetically determined uh, and interestingly uh, most of the population human population 96% of people in the world are right handed individuals most of the left handers uh, you would think that left handers would have the right right hemisphere dominant however most of the 70% of the left handers also have the left hemisphere dominant and a minority of them about 15% have the right hemisphere dominant and the rest of the 15% have it mixed so both uh, rare individuals have uh, uh, both hemisphere having categorical ability you can imagine that these people are quite versatile um uh, secondly uh, dyslexia as i mentioned is word blindness uh, it seems that it's it's uh, it's more common in left handers uh, than in right handers and uh, again is a it's a very uh, interesting stat that left handers have a slightly but significantly shorter lifespan than right handers it's just a a a statistical um, uh, impression that uh, that is uh, floating around uh, and any left handers listening to this lecture should not should not worry a lot about this it's just a stat coming to the lesions so the uh, lesions of the categorical hemisphere mainly 
um, uh, express themselves as language disorders or aphasia. We will discuss uh, this in a bit uh, in this lecture. Uh, lesion of the representational hemisphere, the non-dominant one, doesn't have a significant language disorder component. Uh, these people actually, on the other hand, uh, they talk uh, too much sometimes and uh, uh, sometimes they even, you can even say that they are hyperactive or euphoric. Uh, so, so language, uh, uh, the words and all that thing is not, uh, is not a big issue in representational hemisphere, the, the words itself, but the, the making sense of uh, speech, of their speech, is, is an issue. A stereognosis, as I mentioned, is the then a lack of ability to identify objects by feeling them. Uh, if you have been listening to these lectures, I have uh, discussed in detail in basal ganglia uh, what PPC is, posterior parietal cortex, um, and what it does. What it does. This is, uh, as I just nickname it, the GPS of the body. It has all the motor uh, and sensory uh, uh, coordinates stored in it and it gives you a pretty good idea of where you are in reference to your surroundings, um, uh, both your body and the surroundings. And I refer the, uh, the listener to that part of the basic ganglia lecture where I discuss PPC in detail. So, uh, the neglect syndrome rather, uh, where you have, where the subject will ignore a part of the body uh, completely uh, is 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 a part of this uh, whole thing, uh, the syndrome. Okay, uh, so th that's done. Uh, inability to tell a story or make a joke. Again, uh, it requires an art. It requires imagination. Uh, it requires a sense of humor. All of which can be lacking in people who have uh, the non-dominant hemisphere in trouble. Right, so now we start with language. Language, as I mentioned, is uh, the, f uh, the basis of uh, how we, we, we communicate with each other as species, how we express ourselves. Mm -hmm. It's the way, it's the, it's the fundamental basis of human intelligence and a key part of culture. Uh, so language is important. Uh, the areas, uh, as I mentioned already, that concern language are two, Wernicke's area, and Broca's area, and if you remember your cerebral cortex uh, surface uh, anatomy or topology, you would you would remember that uh, the area uh, called Wernicke's area is a large area centered in the posterior part of the superior temporal gyrus, uh, located near the auditory cortex. Okay, uh, while the Broca's area is is in the posterior part of the inferior temporal gyrus. Uh, very conveniently placed near the, uh, so Broca's is, is placed near the motor, uh, uh, the motor cortex where uh, the face is represented. So you can imagine that this area, the Broca's, is related with the motor aspects of speech. So getting, uh, uh, controlling all the aspects of uh, articulation, phonation, etc and it's conveniently placed near the cerebral cortical part which deals with the face okay uh, so these are the two areas and they're connected by uh, the articulate fasciculus the articulate fasciculus you can imagine is the is is a is the band of the thick band of fibers which originate from uh, the Wernicke's and they go to the uh, broker's area so whatever word selection that you would like to speak is picked up from here Wernicke's and transmitted down the arcuate fasciculus highway to the broker's area okay so this is this is one thing another very interesting aspect you may find interesting is when you are uh, when you are born and you uh, learn your your native language that first language uh, wherever you are it is stored in a specific area of the broker's area okay and then any subsequent languages that you learn it is uh, uh, stored in other areas of the brokers uh, and not in the uh, the area where the native language sits okay uh, children who are bilingual uh, from the start so their 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 parents teach them uh, multiple languages or two or three or whatever how many number of languages uh, right from birth so their mother tongue is not just one one tongue it's uh, many languages or two or three 
uh, they all of those languages would sit uh, or occupy one area of the broker's area okay and all of them will be like a native language for these kids okay so it's actually um, uh, recommended that if you want to teach them multiple languages you better start early in their in their in their grooming and teach them the language that you would like to uh, additional language that you would like to uh, them to know uh, from their early early years so that uh, the same broker area uh, can deal with all those languages uh, as reflexly as we speak our, our our mother tongue or our native native language uh, a very interesting fact uh, for my for my pakistani uh, viewers is the story of Ghulam Isa Khan who was a celebrated uh, bureaucrat and later on became uh, uh, I would say a noted president of the state of Pakistan uh, and later on uh, his presidency turned a bit co uh, controversial as well however uh, actually one of the most famous engineering institutions of Pakistan uh, GIK is named after the guy Ghulam Isa Khan Institute GIK um, so he had a degenerative uh, brain disorder if I remember he probably had uh, Alzheimer's uh, as I recall and part of his uh, uh, memory starts to uh, erode as he as he progressed in Alzheimer's uh, so he was fluent in English and uh, actually very articulate but he forgot English uh, because of the disease uh, that part of brokers just went uh, followed by uh, because he hailed from KPK uh, uh, so he, he knew uh, multiple dialects of uh, the Pashto language which is the native language in KPK the province of Pakistan uh, all those dialects also went okay that he that he added to his uh, language banks later on in his life uh, while I guess he was an adolescent or a teen uh, however the the original uh, village he was from the dialect of Pashto from there uh, that state that state so in his in his uh, final years he could only communicate uh, in that specific dialect of Pashto that he learned literally uh, from his mum uh, in his native village so this is how uh, brokers uh, brokers area work and uh, let's hope that this interesting uh, thing is interesting for you okay so the two aspects uh, of speech as I mentioned is sensory and motor sensory is um, uh, dealt by Wernicke's uh, motor is dealt by broker uh, if we break down sensory into auditory input or visual input so uh, you may uh, speak a heard word uh, something that you've heard and you may speak a written word something that you have read there are two pathways a very good diagram in, Ga in Guyton uh, where he talks about how do you uh, what are the various aspects of the sensory uh, component and the motor component of words that you have heard and now you want to speak uh, about them and words which you have seen in a book or in written form somewhere and you are speaking from that uh, so let's let's take it up from the the hearing bit here so as you can see uh, that this is the brokers this is the Wernicke's this is he has shown the motor cortex okay uh, the article physicalist is shown here as well uh, uh, the primary auditory area which receives what you have heard uh, processes it in the secondary auditory area uh, uh, sends this information to the Wernicke's area where word selection would take place where you would select what how would you ex how would you want to express it in words what you have just heard that information is then sent down the articulate uh, uh, arcuate fasciculus to the broker's area uh, the broker's area will issue the relevant motor related commands uh, so that those words can be spoken the physical aspect of it those commands will then be given to the motor cortex for onward processing and you say the heard word okay similarly uh, but uh, in a in a slightly different pathway 
the written word is of course perceived by the primary visual area which then gives it to the secondary visual area for for extracting meaning of it uh, the word then remember the angular gyrus the angular gyrus further processes it uh, extracts the meaning out of that then all that meaning and and that and that information is is fed into uh, uh, the Wernicke's area okay and the Wernicke's area then similarly word selection and all that is sent down the uh, arcuate fasciculus to the brokers and brokers does the same thing with uh, the, the, the incoming uh, commands turns them into motor commands uh, sends it to the motor cortex for onward um, uh, articulation and all that motor aspect of speech so this is these are the two aspects very important aspects of speaking the heard and the written word uh, mind you this is also a famous university question and it comes as as such uh, you are asked to uh, give the the pathway of uh, the heard word and uh, how a written word is spoken okay it's a pet university question uh, if you remember this from one of my earlier lectures this this uh, pet scan images they show uh, they they basically are from people who uh, have been asked to uh, uh, participate in this test uh, pet scan machine is constantly uh, imaging their brain and they're asked to do various uh, tasks so if you can see uh, the speaking bit here uh, you can see that the the area that lit are, are, are here this is the uh, corresponds to the Wernicke's uh, and this this is relates to the brokers and this is the motor cortex so while the guy is speaking obviously the motor cortex would lit up more than the rest Wernicke's has already done its job uh, brokers is still doing it and hence it's more uh, prominent the yellow pigment and the yellow and the red ring in it if you can see that is the most active area and this is while the chap is speaking okay okay now we can talk about language disorders having understood the various uh, normal physiology of language uh, language disorders are called aphasias and let me just define it here so that this uh, doesn't cause confusion later on these are abnormalities of language language functions uh, they are not uh, related to any uh, deficiency in language due to vision disorders or hearing problems or any motor paralysis motor aspects of speech so all all those things i.e vision hearing and motor paralysis all of these will cause problems in speech uh, however, they won't be called aphasias. Aphasias are purely issues with uh, the uh, the Wernicke's and the Broca's, those things, uh, not including vision, hearing and other issues with uh, with phonation. Okay. So with that uh, clarified, and this is a, this can be a big confusion, by the way, later on in your clinical years as well. So let's let's just clear this out here. Okay. Um, and most of these uh, 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 lesions uh, in the categorical hemisphere, and we've established that the seat of uh, language is the categorical hemisphere, the dominant hemisphere. Uh, it's due to embolism or thrombosis of a cerebral vessel, which is supplying, say, the Wernicke's or the Broca's or the arcuate fasciculus. Okay, so well, all those areas which we have discussed uh, today, which directly involve language. Uh, anything happening to them any blood supply which uh, may uh, get interrupted or uh, any physical lesion any tumor which uh, partially or completely destroys them will uh, will generate uh, a set of disorders uh, labeled as aphasias so what are aphasias the classification is broad classification uh, is Wernicke's aphasia and motor aphasia Okay, so for, for, and then there's another way of uh, classifying this. So let me just uh, first concentrate on this. Uh, when we say that uh, uh, there is a Wernicke's aphasia, uh, what we mean is the Wernicke's area uh, is 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 uh, affected in a significant manner. And as I mentioned, I've been um, I've mentioned in the previous lecture where we talked about the different parts of the cerebral cortex and. Uh, we, we mentioned how important the Wernicke's area is in generally in intelligence language being a significant part of it but uh, the rest of the reasoning and the analysis uh, and the basically all intelligence sits in Wernicke's area okay so when Wernicke's area goes uh, aphasia is 
a very um, uh, uh, expressive part of it, i.e., the person, the person's ability to use language as a tool to communicate is very visual. It's very visceral. It's uh, in the face. Uh, however, you need to appreciate that when the Wernickes go, his intelligence also gets severely hampered. Okay, so this is called uh, this is the sort of global aphasia in which um, his his expression of language will be will be impossible. Okay, uh, he will phonate because uh, he will produce sounds because his brokers is fine, uh, but he won't make any sense. Okay. Uh, he will be he, his talk will be gibberish. It will be nonsensical. It won't be any 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 meaning to it. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, in motor aphasia, uh, you have dysarthria, so lack of uh, the ability to articulate. Uh, you you read this in the cerebellum as well, which which helps you talk the the motor aspects of talking. Okay. So in motor aphasia, the brokers is affected. Now, if the brokers is affected, all the seat of learning of uh, or, or, the, or knowledge or, or your vocabulary which sits in the Wernickes that's intact. So you can imagine a person who knows what to say but he just can't say it because of problems in the motor speech area. Okay, So this person will, will utter words which make sense, uh, uh, not gibberish completely. However, his, his timing of the speech and his, his, his speech will be slurred and all over the place. However, uh, you need to make uh, appreciate the difference between the Wernicke's aphasia and motor aphasia, uh, as I just explained. Uh, another way to define or classify aphasias are is are these two. Oops, I'll just clear that. This. Okay, so non-fluent, uh, fluent, and anomic. So now we talk about some details of these uh, uh, non-fluent and fluent aphasias. Uh, the non-fluent aphasia uh, is, uh, as mentioned, uh, a lesion in the Broca's area. The speech would be slow, words will be, uh, it will be difficult to come up with words. The damage, people with severe damage will be limited to just a couple of words um, uh, with which they will need to express uh, all their meanings and all their language and emotions. Uh, interestingly, sometimes these words uh, which the patient is using were actually the words which were in his or her broker's area at the time of the injury to the broker's area. So whenever, when, so for example, uh, this person had a stroke of the broker's area, okay? So at the time of the stroke, whichever words were in the broker's at that time, the fateful time of that accident, will be retained forever in this person and those were the, those are the words now which he or she will have to use uh, in all in all in all uh, the language uh, that this person speaks uh, so you can imagine the limitation of expression of language in uh, these type of areas uh, this, these type of aphasias uh, coming to fluent aphasia there are a couple of subtypes one is the Wernicke's uh, related fluent aphasia then there, there is conduction aphasia uh, uh, anomic aphasia. Let's start with Wernicke's. You can imagine if the Wernicke goes or the Wernicke is partially or fully damaged, then the speech itself um, uh, can be normal uh, as far as the uh, amount of speech is, is, uh, is uh, concerned, not the content, because the content comes from Wernicke's and the, the speech itself comes from brokers. Brokers in these people are intact, so they may talk and may, may talk excessively. But their speech is full of jargon, uh, makes little sense. They come up with, uh, uh, with, with uh, uh, new words to express themselves, new logisms, uh, which doesn't make sense to the, uh, to the audience. Um, and they fail to comprehend meaning, and spoke, uh, meaning of spoken and written words because the Wernicke's is where the processed auditory words and uh, read word are are, are fed into and the, it's the Wernicke which is involved. So you can imagine a fluent aphasia, uh, a unique one in this form, okay, where the Wernicke is involved. Uh, conduction aphasia, uh, as the name indicates, it, ca it can be a bit misleading. Uh, well, let's, let's, let's see what happens in there, then we'll look at the etiology. Uh, so in conduction aphasia, the person can speak relatively well and can have good auditory comprehension, but 
cannot put parts uh, of the words together to to or or bring up words okay uh, originally thought uh, to be a problem with the arcuate fasciculus uh, which connects the wernickes and the brokers however uh, latest research has found that it may be related to a lesion near the auditory cortex okay and not the arcuate fasciculus okay uh, so that's conduction aphasia <clears throat> Uh, anomic aphasia is is also very interesting and this is uh, uh, due to a damage uh, uh, of the angular gyrus which uh, you know now it's it's a place uh, posteriorly uh, to the Wernicke's area it's in between Wernicke's and the uh, occipital visual processing areas okay um, so if a specific lesion of the angular gyrus uh, in the categorical hemisphere happens uh, without affecting Wernicke's or Broca's, uh, there is no difficulty with speech or understanding of auditory information. However, the all sorts of issues come uh, when it's uh, written language or pictures. Uh, visual information is not, uh, it can't be processed because that's the work of the angular gyrus. Uh, and this, this, this kind of aphasia uh, then leads to, specifically to the visual input. <clears throat> uh, this is the, this is termed as anomic aphasia. Uh, we will come to a physical uh, come to a we will talk about a physical example we will come to a practical exercise in a bit uh, which uh, hopefully will bring all of these aphasias in context but before we do that just to, to just two interesting footnotes is that writing is also abnormal in all aphasias where speech is abnormal okay this is, this is just something to note and people who have their categorical hemisphere uh, uh, problems also cannot uh, use sign language uh, as a form of communication. So this is that practical uh, application of what we have read in terms of non-fluent and fluent aphasias. Uh, so these are four types of patients that they showed a chair. They just put a chair in front of them and they asked these four different types of aphasia patients uh, to to express uh, what they what they are what, what they are seeing. The non-fluent broker area person uh, came up with, with with this word, and now you know why he or she came up with this type of word because the brokers is gone. Is they are trying to say che, but since the brokers is not there. Uh, the f the the pronunciation, the phonation is 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 damaged. Uh, fluent or Wernicke's area, uh, you see that he will come up with uh, various types of uh, words, which may not may or may not make sense. Uh, conduction aphasia, uh, again, is there will be a problem in uh, slotting in words to make a meaningful uh, language output. And very interestingly, in the anomic one, uh, the guy would say, I know what it is, I have a lot of them, but he just won't pinpoint that it's a chair, okay, because of his inability to process visual cues. Uh, 